The photo here, you may recognise, is from Blind Arrow Woodman's Hall, where Vic and Contemporary Ancient Theatre will be staging <coughs> for the play later in the year. Um, they've done a wonderful job of turning Price Technicolor, very sort of uh, Andy Warhol. Um, but we're going to go back, obviously, to 1789 to begin the lecture. I have thought of asking Vic to do this as the person who will be, will be acting Richard Price, but I'll give it a go myself. Tremble, all ye oppressors of the world. Take warning, all ye supporters of slavish governments and slavish hierarchies. Call no more, absurdly and wickedly, reformation, innovation. You cannot now hold the world in darkness. Struggle no longer against increasing light and liberality. Restore to mankind their rights and consent to the correction of abuses before they and you are destroyed together. So, those are the last published words of Richard Price. Uh, words, I think, that may only really have been eclipsed around 50 years later, where Marx and Engel asked for the workers of the world to unite. And just to put it in context, this, as I mentioned, uh, was a talk or a sermon from 1789, so published just as the French Revolution was unfolding. And in this text, I'll move to the, to the cover, Price is, ex is expressing his support for the French Revolution, and really, Price regards the French Revolution as some sort of continuation of the Glorious Revolution from 1688, and the principles that he believed that revolution had established. So he talks about the right of freedom of religion, he talks about the right to resist the abuse of power, and he talks about the right to choose those who govern us, and to dismiss or cashier them. Now, this particular text is of enormous historical um, import, really. It would precipitate what's known as the Revolution Controversy, which is an exchange of political views that lasted around a decade after the publication of this initial text, and really it's regarded as perhaps one of the most important formative discussions of modern politics. This is where you have those ideas around modern political ideologies being developed that really still inform politics today. Now some would have you believe that the person who initiated the revolution controversy was a man called Edmund Burke and his very famous text, Reflections on the French Revolution. But in fact it was our friend and good Dr Richard Price who began it all with his text and really he compelled Burke to respond because largely of who Richard Price was and also what he was saying. That's to say, in particular really for Burke, he felt that he had to respond to this really preeminent radical and dissenter who had such a name for himself, really who had an international stature because of his links to France and America. And also he was afraid that with his text and with his words, Richard Price would somehow manage to bring together the progressive forces on both sides of the English Channel, France and the British state, and then sweep away the hierarchy, really, that Edmund Burke uh, was a representative or embodiment of. So, in a sense, what we've got with this text from Richard Price is a rallying cry to the dissenters, to the radicals within Britain at the time. But it is also actually a sort of mature statement of some of the more important aspects of his political thought. And that's really what I'd like to bring to the fore, at least in the first part of the talk tonight, is some of those principles so that we can begin to understand in a bit more detail really the nature of Christ's politics, and in particular perhaps think about how they resonate across the ages. And then we'll take a step back and we'll try to understand a little bit more about the man himself, uh, where he came from and how it was he became the international um, leading light that he was in, in his life and how he came from you know, dissenting um, quite, a, I, I suppose, ordinary background here in, in Wales and how he built such a reputation that was really feared by the establishment in Britain. And then to conclude, I'll think about or discuss perhaps one or two ideas of how the story of Richard Price really 
fits in many interesting ways within the sort of political conversations and discourse of today. And I might perhaps mention independence and uh, hear a few thoughts on that. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So I want to start with this idea of civic nationalism. Now it's conceived traditionally in contrast to the idea of ethnic nationalism. So civic nationalism broadly is this idea that the nation and one's membership of the nation is grounded really in the political institutions, the legal order and the rights that come from those institutions and that our citizenship in an important sense is based upon our contribution to the political community, to its institutions. And this is contrasted then with the idea of ethnic nationalism that is said really to extol ideas of ethnicity, race, language, culture and tradition and using those ideas as the basis for the nation and for membership of the nation. And of course these categories, perhaps more than anything, have been used in sort of ideological ways in political debates, really as a sort of shorthand to describe different nations and different nationalities. So in a sense, the good, sort of open, tolerant Western democracies are described as civic nations, and then other nationalities are seen as more narrow or exclusionary or racist, and, you know, in, for one, well, during the 1990s, for example, these sorts of ideas of ethnic nationalism were often ascribed to the emerging states in Central and Eastern Europe. Closer to home, of course, the idea of ethnic nationalism has often been used as a slur to describe Welsh and Scottish nationalism, in contrast, then, to the idea of a broader, more open, civic British nationalism. Yeah. Those terms haven't been used so much recently for perhaps um, obvious reasons, but we'll move on to that. I mean, the truth is, though, when we talk about nations and nationhood, really they tend to use a mixture of these sorts of ideas. Um, and these ideas perhaps are more salient during particular times, um, depending on what the context is. So in particular, if we think about Britain in the last decade or so, think about the Windrush scandal, we think about the sort of discourse that emerged with Brexit, and we think about the current treatment of asylum seekers, really what we see is that you know, below this notion of a British civic society, there lurks this far more sort of aggressive really form of ethnic nationalism, <coughs> and you might say is grounded really in a white, anglophone, quite possibly as well Christian sort of ethnic nationalism. Now, historically as well, interestingly enough, Language has also been used or thought of as a particularly important sort of marker of ethnic nationalism. And if you go back to roots of these ideas, people often mention a German philosopher called Herder, who was a contemporary of Price. <coughs> and he really talked about the importance of language to identity. But what's interesting with language really is that actually in many ways it can be used by the civic nation as well. Um, that's to say there's often this idea of a state language, isn't there? that's deployed as a sort of necessary condition for membership. So when we think about immigrants or asylum seekers, refugees, now, you know, there's a citizenship test that involves testing people's English. And so, within a particular context, you know, civic nationalism could also be exclusionary, if you like. The justification, in a way, is, well, people need to learn the language to be able to partake in a, as full as a civic, um, full civic participants in the democratic in the democratic order. Now as a sort of aside for some of this discussion, it's interesting if you think about um, that element of language of course with respect to Wales. Because one of the practical consequences of creating a state language in that sense is obviously you can, can exclude people, but in the context of a country like Wales where you've got a minoritized language such as Welsh, then, you know, immigrants again, refugees, asylum seekers, or anybody really is not entitled to free education or free lessons for the Welsh language in the same way as they are to the Welsh language, uh, English language rather. So it sort of reflects how civic nationalism can even create these sort of tiers, if you like, or hierarchies. Now, whilst Herder, this German philosopher, is connected with this idea of ethnic nationalism, when we think about civic nationalism, People often turn, interestingly enough, to a philosopher from the 19th century, a chap called Ernest Renan, who was a Breton. So somebody else like Price, who was from the Celtic fringe, if you like. And they tend to connect this idea of civic nationalism with Renan, who was um, expanding these ideas in the latter part of the 19th century. 
However, my sort of contention is, is that if we look at Richard Price's work over a century before that, what we really see is Price elucidating this idea of civic nationalism in a very sort of concise way. So we turn to the text here from uh, Discourse on the Love of Our Country. This is in the opening pages. He says, But by our country is meant, in this case, not the soil or the spot of earth on which we happen to have been born, not the forests and fields, but that community of which we are members, or that body of companions and friends and kindred who are associated with us under the same constitution of government, protected by the same laws, and bound together by the same civil polity. So really what Price here is sort of denying really is that the idea of where you're born should dictate whether you're part of a nation. And likewise he sort of put into one side any ideas of nationhood that's grounded in sort of romantic ideals or tradition or the land or these sorts of ideas. Rather, you know, for him it's this idea that you put through his Christianity in, in many ways. But his role as a dissenting minister meant that he was part of this non-conformist tradition outside the Church of England. Of course, a non-conformist tradition that would become mainstream for Wales in the 19th century with all our chapels and the independents and the Baptists and so forth. But what this meant that, in Richard Price's era is that it effectively made him a sort of second-class citizen because they were the test laws. It was legislation that meant that dissenters couldn't have certain offices and they couldn't partake in the civic community in the same way. So he's sort of peripheral in that sense, even though by the time he's 17, 18, he's down in London. But also, of course, he's a Welshman, very likely Welsh-speaking, uh, and therefore hailing really from what we today sometimes refer to as the Celtic fringe. So Price is this sort of peripheral figure, even though he's at the heart of a lot of these debates down in, in London about the future <coughs> of Britain. As an individual, in terms of his status, he obviously is a peripheral person. So, for me, when I'm thinking about Price articulating these ideas, and this early sort of idea of civic nationalism, for him I think it's an ideal that he would have considered really crucial in trying to extend full membership and participation in this new Britain, beyond really, <coughs> beyond the established elites who dominated at the time. So that's an elite really, uh, that the likes of Edmund Burke um, defended, and it's an elite really that won the day in Richard Price's time. Uh, that is to say, they won the argument, and that's perhaps one of the reasons Richard Price isn't so well remembered. Indeed, the historian, J.C.D. Clarke, he believes that the fact that Burke won out in this um, debate meant that the British state actually would never really develop along the lines of or in accordance uh, with this ideal of Price's civic nationalism, but in fact, the British state would develop in accordance with this sort of historic, ethnic, anglophone, aristocratic identity. And one wonders, or one could perhaps um, surmise, that really this crucial victory at a crucial time for this new British state, which was under 100 years old at the time, that that really had huge consequences in terms of how the British state developed, and those are consequences that I would suggest we still really live with today in terms of the sort of mainstream understandings of what Britishness is. And then, you know, you can allude perhaps to some of the discourse that's emerged over the last 10 years. Okay, so that's civic nationalism. What's important, I think, as well, when you're thinking about Richard Price and trying to understand his ideas, especially on nationalism, is that they're part of a sort of wider array of ideas, and a wider set of values, if you like. And really, one of the main sort of ideas behind this pamphlet that he, <coughs> that he had published is that he wanted to express how nationalism can only really be valid, it can only be moral, if you like, when it's expressed within the broader context of global relations, but also really that it's sort of curtailed by reason and it's curtailed by sympathy for our fellow human beings. That's to say, we need to deploy reason. We shouldn't let our nationalistic passions, if you like, run away with themselves. So civic nationalism really is the basis for this form of patriotism that Price is in favour of. <coughs> and he complements it then with two other very important principles. Firstly, he says that our love for our country should not mean that we regard ourselves as being superior to other countries. 
And he also says that our patriotism should go hand in hand with a cooperative spirit, that nation states shouldn't be in competition. And really, for my money, these sort of ideals lay the basis for what we can call crisis cosmopolitanism, this idea of having, if you like, global horizons in terms of our politics. <coughs> so, just to quote again from, from the text, he says, we can do little for the interest of mankind at large. To this interest, however, all other interests are subordinate. The noblest principle in our nature is the regard to general justice and that goodwill which embraces all the world. I've already observed this, but it cannot be too often repeated. For our immediate attention, though our immediate attention must be employed in promoting our own interest and that of our nearest connections, yet we must remember that a narrow interest will always give way to a more extensive interest. In pursuing particularly the interest of our country, we ought to carry our views beyond it. We should love it ardently, but not exclusively. We ought to seek its good by all the means that our different circumstances and abilities will allow. But at the same time, we ought to consider ourselves as citizens of the world and take care to maintain a just regard to the rights of other countries. So, you know, in many ways, what Price is expressing here are a lot of those ideals, a lot of those arguments that he's been deploying for many years at this point. So, in some sense, his support for the American War of Independence really related to his anger and frustration at the sort of superior attitude that he saw that was part of the emerging British state and that was part of the way that they run, they ran the empire. He was also one of the first thinkers, really, to develop in earnest this idea of a sort of world federation of states on the sort of model of what was emerging in America at the time. So Price believed in this idea that you could have a sort of federal world government where all the states of the world came together in order to cooperate instead of competing with each other. And so he was one of those first sort of thinkers who really tried to articulate this idea that a peaceful worldwide federation is possible. And of course these are the sorts of ideals that the League of Nations and the United Nations have been founded upon. The Price, of course, would have liked to have seen the United Nations go further and become a real sort of world government that legislates properly in many of those aspects of politics that are truly global. More generally as well, we can sort of see in these sentiments the way in which Price really thinks that moral virtue has to be the, at the heart of politics, not just in terms of domestic politics, but also on a global level. And also I'd say that, you know, Price's basic sense of humanity really comes across here. And that's the sort of sense of humanity as well, which of course would mean that he was an advocate for the abolition of slavery, and he very much held the Americans to account in terms of his discussions and debates with him, with them as the new America was emerging. The third aspect then, the last of, uh, aspect of Price's politics that I wanted to just pay a bit of attention to as well, is what we might call today his republicanism. So, although his republicanism is related in good part to his criticisms of the monarchy and also the need to separate powers, so you don't have those who are creating laws also executing laws, what's really striking for me in terms of Price's particular form of republicanism is the way in which he's really skeptical of those in power and he's also very cautious about the ill effects of power on political leaders. I mean, I'd go so far as to say there's almost a sort of anarchist impulse in some of the comments that Price makes, because he's so aware of the way in which ultimately power corrupts. And that's really at the heart of the sort of anarchist position which says we shouldn't really have government, because government you know, brings so much power into the hands of so few that it's inevitable that it corrupts. So our ally to this idea then really is Price's also sense of how as citizens we shouldn't be passive but actually we really need to be as active as we can be. So ultimately really it's our duty to challenge our leaders, to hold them account, to account, not just because this is really the only way we can guarantee you know, good governments as it were, 
But I think also for Price, this idea of participation in the political community is part of his moral outlook as well. That it's really a privilege on our part, but also our duty as humans to contribute in this way. So just to take another quick quote from, from the text, he says, Men in power, and less better disposed than is common, are always endeavouring to extend their power. They hate the doctrine that it is a trust derived from the people and not a right vested in themselves. For this reason, the tendency of every government is to despotism. And in this, the best constituted governments must end if the people are not vigilant, ready to take alarms, and determined to resist abuses as soon as they begin. Very timely indeed. This vigilance, therefore, it is our duty to maintain. Whenever it is withdrawn and the people cease to reason about their rights and to be awake to encroachments, they are in danger of being enslaved, and their servants will soon become their masters. Jumping a little bit then, he addresses the reader, do you practice virtue yourselves and study to promote it in others? Do you obey the laws of your country and aim at doing your part towards maintaining and perpetuating its privileges? Do you always give your vote on the side of public liberty? And are you ready to pour out your blood in its defence? Passionate words indeed. Okay, so... Having presented to you some of the fundamentals of crisis politics, I'd like to step back a little bit now and yeah, give a brief account of the man, give a sense of his upbringing and his background, uh, a background, as I say, that led to him having this sort of global stature. So, as I'm presuming a lot of you here will know, Price was obviously from this area, uh, brought up not far from Pencoid, the bottom of the Garn Valley, um, in Tipton Farm, and was born there in 1723, a little way down the, the mountain from where the church of Southern Kine sits. Um, if you want some information or more the history of that particular era, you can ask uh, Roger and his associates with the uh, Garland Valley Heritage Society, as they know an awful lot more than I do. I do. Um, but just to say, Roger was telling me the other day when Price was a, a young lad, it would have been maybe four buildings in that uh, particular part of the valley at the time. It just gives you a sense of how rural it was. And obviously we're talking about you know, pre-industrial revolution uh, at this time. So Price is growing up in a very different world um, to some of the later perhaps political figures we might be familiar with. And what's important as well in terms of Price's background is that they were very much part of the Puritan tradition. Uh, there's Chapel Samuel Jones, who back in the 1660s, uh, 1650s, had been part of the expansion of Puritanism into Wales. And obviously with the Restoration it meant that the Puritans were sidelined once again. And Samuel Jones set up, as it were, in the Garden Valley, established a meeting house there. And Richard Price's dad, Rice Price, was part of the community of Puritans who developed around that particular focal point. And I think... When we regard Price as a character, one can maybe think about these Puritan roots as being perhaps an influence in terms of the immense sort of relentless work ethic that he had. You get a sense from the exhibition and these slides, the enormous amount of work that Price did in all these different fields. And I think there's something there about that Puritan upbringing that would have influenced him there. There probably is an element as well of this upbringing that was quite influential in the way that Price regarded wealth and luxury. So wealth really for Price was only to be enjoyed as a means really um, to enrich people in terms of um, their spirituality and their intellectual nature. So wealth then really was a problem when it began, began to be sort of gathered in too many, <coughs> well sorry, in too little, you know, too few hands. That's to say, Price had a sort of basic um, opposition, really, to capitalism in that sense, because he thought as well that as well as power, that money could corrupt. So he had a very egalitarian view of things, and I think that's partly to do with this Puritan upbringing. He would have enjoyed a similar sort of education to a lot of other bright young men in South Wales at the time, 
in the sense that he then attended a number of the dissenting academies that were being established during that time. So first of all he was in Neath, and then he went over to uh, uh, an academy called Pentoin, which is very close to where Cross Hans is today. Interestingly enough, after a few years in Pentoin, his father took him out. Uh, there was another Samuel Jones in uh, Pentoin, who unlike his namesake in uh, the Garden Valley, was a lot more radical in his views. And Richard Price's father was very concerned about this. He got wind of the fact that Richard Price was being taught some of these more radical, if you like, uh, liberal theological ideas, pulled him out of there and moved him across to Talgath, which is, as you know, is sort of the northeast of here, about 25, 30 miles away. And in Talgath, um, he became under the tutelage of a very influential uh, nonconformist at the time um, called uh, Vavasa Griffiths. And it's said that Richard Price was actually taught there at a very similar time to the other great Welshmen of this era, William Williams, Panther Kellin. And it's really interesting to think about those two figures there together in Talgath, one who then goes down to London and becomes this figure of global repute, and then William Williams, one of those who obviously um, you know, changed the face of Wales really with the Methodist revival through his hymns and his, uh, his credit poith, his hot religion. So, Talgath, obviously, you know, is a very influential, important place. Richard Price was there, but when he was there, his father and then his mother very shortly died after, thereafter. And with that, he ensured that his <coughs> sisters uh, were in safe hands and had the money they needed down in Bridgend. And that's when he moved down to London. Uh, and that's where he got the, yeah, the, the protection, if you like, or, or the encouragement of his uncle, who was already down in London and uh, a fellow called George Streetfield, I think that's his name, took him under his wing and he became the family cha chaplain for, for that family. And that's really where Price has the time to develop his ideas. And so from around 1740 to the end of about 1750s, he's in quite comfortable surroundings, he's able to develop intellectually, become part of the conversations in London. When the family, um, sorry, when, when his uh, uncle dies, and then when Streetfield dies, Price then takes that opportunity to become, if you like, an independent person. He takes up the ministry in Newington Green, where he would live with his wife Sarah, and that's where he published his first work. So in 1758, he publishes a piece of moral philosophy that really establishes him as a sort of big intellectual figure in London at the time. So you again, Mick. Right. Now what's interesting in very broad terms around the ideas that Price is developing at this time is that they go against the, go against the grain in many ways. So there's a philosophical school developing at the time called British Empiricism. It's associated with names like David Hume. And Richard Price really rejects this emerging mainstream and has very different ideas. So the empiricists, in very broad terms, believe that everything we know about the world comes to us through our senses, that the mind, if you like, is a sort of blank slate. And so in that sense, our moral ideas are not things that we take from God or from some you know, timeless kind of moral objective order. For the empiricists, they believed our moral ideas stem from our emotions. So we say something is good because it makes us feel good, or we say something is morally bad because it makes us feel bad. Now, Price diverged completely from this emerging trend, and really, he was more sort of aligned with a lot of, the, uh, a lot of his contemporaries from the continent, so thinkers from France and um, the German tradition. And again, I think there's something interesting here about this chap who goes down to London as a young man, who develops these ideas, he's in the thick of all these discussions, and rather than taking on these ideas that are developing in London, he comes at it from a very different direction. And again, I would sort of argue that one can only perhaps fully understand this if you think of Price as a Welshman, as a Welsh thinker who was steeped in his own uh, intellectual tradition. So forgive the sort of um, self publicising here, but just to give you a bit of context about my own interests, you know, I write on political philosophy, I also write on the history of ideas, <coughs> and the work I've done around Price, really, is partly about trying to understand how he fits 
in this broader Welsh international tradition. So those are a couple of books that I've written in the last sort of four or five years which explore this idea. And yeah, it's very much the case that from my point of view, as I say, we can't really understand Christ properly in terms of his politics and his philosophy unless we have a sense of him as a, as a Welshman, if you like. And that's partly because of these Puritan links that I mentioned before, that they're really important, I think, in terms of informing his world view. But also, I would suggest as well that some of the ideas that emerge really sort of fit in with a longer Welsh intellectual tradition that goes back quite some centuries, really. Um, just one example of this is the Puritan thinker, or Morgan Floyd, who was really important in the 1650s, 1660s. The text that he produced are sort of regarded as being hugely influential on Christianity in Wales, on the non-conformist tradition that developed. And if you look at some of the ideas behind Christ's view of the world, you see similarities. So, for example, there's the influence of the great Greek philosopher Plato. People often talk about Christ as a Platonist, and you see that with Morgan Floyd as well. Then there's the idea of millenarianism, which is this idea that uh, there'll be the second coming, and there'll be a millennium, or the reign of sort of peace, peace and justice on earth. This was an immensely important idea for the Puritans in the 1650s and 1660s. They were having discussions, you know, long intellectual debates around which exact year the, mille the millennium, the new millennium would occur, this, you know, new age would happen. You see some of that in Christ as well, this idea that, you know, we're working towards a great future. With Christ, it becomes a bit more secular. You don't have quite so much the sort of, you know, um, overbearing, if you like, Christian sense. But with Christ, you have this idea of Christ, uh, sorry, history moving, as it were, towards this great utopian future. And I think that's a particularly sort of uh, Welsh theme that you can see in other patterns of thinking that have emerged over time. Happy to talk about that a bit more um, if anybody has any questions, but I just wanted to give you a sort of brief sense of why it is I think that Price is somebody we can think of as a distinctly Welsh thinker. How am I doing for time? Am I right, sir? Okay. When people start dropping off, I'll begin to Yeah, the same thing with my mother. <laughs> okay. So, whilst I think it's really interesting and important to understand Price as this Welsh thinker, it's obviously important as well and not to distract, not to distract from the ways in which his research and his ideas were obviously, you know, universal and global in this scope, and that's across a number of different disciplines. So, you know, his moral philosophy, as I've just said, went against the grain of this idea that our emotions are, you know, or our moral ideals are an expression of our emotions. He rather thought that they The connection there with Price is that Price was the sort of intellectual executor of his papers and he worked very hard to go through all of Bayes' different ideas and theories and brought one particular theory to light called Bayes' theorem, it was known as Bayes' theorem now, which is basically the basis for probability. So in that sense, it's a theory that, upon which the modern world is built upon in, in, in certain ways. Um, that's to say things like the internet, for example, or artificial intelligence. You know, probability is at the heart of that. And it was Price, really, who worked on the ideas of Bayes and brought that to light. So people say if you'd have done that work today, it'd actually be called the Bayes-Price theorem because of the way in which Price influenced those ideas and brought them to bear. He was also somebody who was heavily involved in establishing the modern insurance industry. You may be thinking, why is a philosopher doing insurance? Well, again, go back to his... Christian upbringing, his Puritan upbringing, his desire to do good in the world. He was such a mathematical genius that he was, these were things that he could work on as a sort of sideline and develop over time. 
and the insurance obviously was really important to ensure that people didn't suffer the sort of misfortunes of life um, too heavily. He also looked on it. This led to the Americans inviting Price over to essentially look after the finances of the new state. Price never went over, we can speculate. Uh, his wife was ill, he was getting older at that time. Um, but in 1781, uh, I think it was, again they extended uh, a hand of friendship to Price and Yale University gave him an honorary doctorate. And the other person accepted an honorary doctorate at the same time as him, which gives you a sense the price of standing, was George Washington. And these are the people that people thought at the time Price would be remembered with. If you look at his obituaries, they talk about Price alongside Jefferson, Franklin, George Washington, Lafayette, and so on. Um, and this is his memory, something I'll reflect on very briefly before I finish. The other important person then is the sort of godmother of feminism, which is Mary Wollstonecraft. I think sometimes in our enthusiasm to extol the virtues of Price, uh, we may go overboard and you know, people perhaps make these statements about him promoting women's rights. In reality, he never wrote um, or reflected on women's rights, but I think we can say he contributed towards, towards the cause because of his intimate relationship with Mary Wollstonecraft. Intimate in the sense that she was deeply inspired by him when she spent time in Newton Green in the 1780s. He supported her financially, <coughs> helped her with her new endeavour, her new school in Newton Green. He also introduced her to the publishers that would go on to publish these enormously influential tracts in terms of the history of feminism. But I think there's something in that relationship with Mary Wollstonecraft. You know, this person who was deeply controversial, she sort of lived an alternative lifestyle, but Price was there for her and he supported her when many others wouldn't. And I think that speaks both of his perhaps character, but also to his openness and this idea that's emerging this year actually around Price as this sort of networker who not only stood up and delivered, uh, you know, political arguments and ideals, but he also helped others to, you know, emerge and to influence. Um, the, the, the political climate of the time. Okay, so to sort of get to the end of things now, I just briefly want to finish off with a few reflections in terms of Price's ideals and the way in which <coughs> one can reflect upon them within the context of today's political discourse. So here are just a few themes that I've picked out. Obviously, as you've heard from one or two of the quotes, I think the issues of democracy and accountability are ones that Price speaks to in very fundamental ways and draws our attention to the importance that we are always on our guard, as it were, with, um, yeah, with respect to our political leaders. And actually, you know, I would say the same thing about devolved power and what happens down in the Senate in Cardiff. I think it's true to say partly because we don't really have a particularly mature or developed press in Wales that things happen down in Cardiff, which politicians, frankly, you know, they get away with it. So it's obviously in very you know, clear ways relevant to what's happening in Westminster, but you know, we need to look closer to home as well. I think education is a really interesting one again. In this text that I've been referring to, he talks about the three sort of the greatest gifts of mankind, and he talks about virtue, he talks about freedom, but he also talks about truth. And you know, for a proper political community to function. We need liberty in order to be able to do the right things. We also need virtue in the sense that we need to make the correct decisions and decide in favour of the good. But he also says truth is fundamental and that truth is delivered to us through knowledge. And this is where Price's discussions are really interesting at a time when the printing press is really getting going and you are having sort of mass printing um, really develop as an industry. That idea of the electorate, as it will, the public being informed, is deeply important to Price. And of course, that is ever more important these days, especially in the age of social media, where you know, fake news and the ability to create stories and influence is really deeper and more extensive than ever. Racism, obviously, is something that's perpetual, but has you know, come to the fore more in recent years through Black Lives Matters. And obviously, Price as an abolitionist is somebody who can reflect upon you as part of that, you know, esteemed tradition, really, of those who have always objected and have tried to change things for the better. There's something perhaps to inspire us. Um, 
especially in the way, as I mentioned, he held the Americans to account. You know, he put it very bluntly to Thomas Jefferson in a letter. How can I be espousing the new America and talking about this land of freedom, or even enslaved people? And of course, Jefferson himself held slaves until the day he died, in fact. Uh, one of the other issues then is quite important and interesting, I think, about prices. You know, we don't want this to develop into hagiography, where here I am talking about all these wonderful things that Price did. I imagine Price would very much expect us to deal with him and his work, you know, with reason and rationality and in a critical way. And one of the things that comes to the fore, actually, in terms of looking at Price, is the way in which indigenous peoples, uh, Native Americans in particular, sort of fall out the picture almost in terms of a lot of the discussions that he's having at the time. And I think that's maybe something for us to reflect upon as well in terms of how we view the world and we look at these issues of marginality and racism and so forth. That issue then of why Richard Price is forgotten, I mean, there's any number of ideas um, and theories one could present in terms of why Price has been forgotten. This man, as I said, who, you know, when he died, it was expected that he would stand shoulder to shoulder with the pantheon of other greats from that era, such as Franklin and so on. He's been forgotten, and you know, some of the suggestions I've heard so far this year is, one, because he lost to Burke. As I mentioned right at the outset, Burke won that competition, in a sense. He was the one who won the debate, especially because Burke had sort of warned that the French Revolution could descend into violence. Price died in 1791, never saw the terror, never had the chance to respond and to discuss what happened and what emerged. So the fact that Price was, you know, against the establishment, then in a sense his arguments were buried by him in work, one can see why in that sense he wouldn't be remembered in the same way. He wasn't recovered in the same way as Mary Wollstonecraft was either. She got much the same treatment, but of course the feminist movement picked up her work at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century. We've also got this idea that perhaps, um, you know, Victorian history, according to Ewan Morris, who's been talking about Richard Price, Victorian history was partly about sort of cleaning up the historical memory of Britain, and so Ewan has this idea that as part of that wider process, the Victorians wanted to sort of expunge a character like Richard Price from historical memory, even though by the end of the Victorian era, of course, a lot of his ideals were starting to emerge. Um, what I would ask, and maybe you know, get others to think about is why in Wales we've forgotten him. Because it's not as if he's a sort of marginal person in terms of his ideals. We're not either talking about sort of died in the wall nationalists like Saunders Lewis. We're talking about somebody who falls squarely in that Welsh progressive internationalist tradition. You know, in many ways you could see him as the forebearer of Lloyd George or the early Lloyd George, early radical Lloyd George, and Ian Bevan fits with that narrative, so I'm genuinely confused as to why Richard Price isn't sort of regarded in that way, because for me, he would be somebody who would sit easily within that sort of labourist Welsh historical tradition. And last of all, I said I'd share a few thoughts on independence. Would Richard Price have been in favour of Welsh independence, to ask the question bluntly? Well, you know, I can't really speak for Richard Price. Um, but we can maybe just reflect on one or two of his ideas to think about where he might stand on the debate today. And really, it's not about what Richard Price would have thought. It's more about, as I say, informing how we discuss some of these things. You know, as a sort of civic nationalist, as I've described really, Richard Price was a sort of big Brit, you know, he was a big unionist, if you like, who wanted to see Britain prevail as a new civic progressive nation. So he had great hopes for Britain. But it's true to say that over time these hopes were sort of dashed in various ways. Patrick Sparrow, a visiting speaker from America, who spoke last week in the PI Head, he very much thought that Price would be in favour of devolution, for example, because he was really, really always emphasising the importance of citizens becoming involved in politics. He expounded direct democracy, so for Price, the closer the sort of political institutions to the people, the better. So in that sense, um, we can perhaps be fairly confident that the idea of devolving power was uh, an important thing for Price. Um, he does have this idea of you know, self-determination of the political community. So when he's supporting America, one of the big ideas is, well, you know, here's a political community 
of its own, with its own ideas and of its own nature, we should be supporting its independence. But I don't think he extended that to Wales and Scotland at the time because he truly saw the British people as a sort of emerging nation, I suppose, and he very much hoped that between perhaps the three peoples that they would drive forward this kind of British civic identity. But he did become frustrated by the 1780s. He'd obviously lost a lot of hope in terms of the new Britain, and maybe that's one of the reasons he had such enthusiasm for the US and France. Uh, Patrick Sparrow actually um, brought to my attention a particular quote from Richard Price, which is an interesting one. Patrick describes it as Price's Declaration of Independence. The idea that you know, Price wanted to become a citizen of nowhere, no longer tied to the British state. And he said, I have learned to consider myself more as a citizen of the world than <coughs> a particular country, and to such a person, every advance that the cause of public liberty makes must be agreeable. And I think perhaps here we have something to reflect upon as well about Price's attitude. Because ultimately it was that general good, universal good, that was of most importance to Price. And our national politics, as it were, should sit within that. So for him, he would support clearly any cause that furthered equality and liberty. So you might say if there was a revolution in his native Wales that expanded those values, then Price, I imagine, would be on board. However, supposing he did get on board with this idea of independent Welsh nation, we also perhaps want to think about what sort of separatism he might avow. That's to say, if you see, his emphasis was on cooperation, it was on mutual respect. So any independent nation needs to be, at the same time, thinking about its relations with others. And so, rather than this idea of becoming inward-looking, Price would avow this idea of self-determination, meaning opportunity to create global links and ensuring that they, where there are any sort of common concerns that nations come together in this time and what he might hope for any sort of future independent Wales. And perhaps in that sense, we can think of Price as somebody who may be um, around or support the idea of a sort of British confederation where the separate nations work very closely together. Anyway, I hope I've some, some <coughs> conveyed at least some of the fundamentals of Price's politics, given you also a sense of the man and conveyed why it is we should remember him, discuss him and reflect on Richard Price in full technical. Thank you very much for listening.